All right, good afternoon, everyone. Please confirm for me that you can hear me in the chat. Right, perfect. So, I guess let's get started. So this is the, well, we're going to go over pronunciation in a second, so I'm just going to spell it out. L-A-T-E-X, introductory work walkthrough. So, yes, let's go. So, first of all, how do you pronounce this? Well, it's basically you pronounce it how you want because there's no official pronunciation. People will tell you there is, there's not. Leslie Lamport, who created LaTeX, LaTeX is the pronunciation I usually go with, he specifically said he's not going to tell anyone how you should pronounce it. So you can pronounce it LaTeX, 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 basically however you want. There's no point fighting over that, just just so you know. Okay, so what is it, first of all? Well, LaTeX is a document preparation system, not a word processor. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with things like Microsoft Word and Google Docs and all the various clones of those that exist. Those are what you see is what you get style editors, where your input is directly affecting the output. You, every change you make changes the output in real time in front of you as you're doing it, so you can make your document look exactly how you want. But LaTeX doesn't do that. The idea is... You get your content first, and LaTeX will do most of the heavy lifting with formatting your document for you. So you use natural commands for things like making sections and adding figures, etc. And LaTeX will optimize the layout of your document based on the, the rules you specify, obviously, but one of the really strong points about it is you only have to do the legwork of setting up your formatting once, and then you can very easily reuse that template on lots of different documents. And the other thing is LaTeX documents are highly portable, so you can take them to pretty much any computer as long as you have all the packages installed, which if you saw my uh, software setup document in the repository, you would know it's pretty straightforward to install a complete text live installation for, for one, for example. And that will give you pretty much any package you could imagine. And LaTeX documents are also very easy to update. So if you need to make a correction later or whatever, you don't have to worry about, oh, if I, if I open this in a different version of Microsoft Word, is the formatting going to work? If I download this Google Docs file in Microsoft Word format, how much formatting is going to be messed up? None of that nonsense. It's just the same formatting on every system doesn't matter what fonts you have installed. Again, LaTeX is its own self-contained thing with its own packages. And that's, that's really one of the main beauties of LaTeX. So, let's start by looking at creating a very basic uh, document. 
So. All right. Uh, top of that cutoff, it looks like it is. Let me fix that real quick. Oh, well, maybe you can see it. Uh... Right, should be a bit better. All right, so. Uh, all right, so what we start with here, so first of all, let's just, and by the way, this document is in the GitLab repository, along with all the other sample documents I have open here that we're going to be looking at, and again, if you, you can find the link right below the, uh, video on Twitch, or it's links.asu.edu slash asu lug hyphen event. So the first thing we have here is document class article, or backslash document class article. Now this is, so okay, like I said before, this whole thing here is basically the smallest possible, most minimal example of a LaTeX document you could have that actually compiles and produces an output. So document class article is basically telling LaTeX, first of all, so this is our command here, document class. An article is the actual class we want. So we're passing that as an argument to the document class command, very similar to functions in pretty much every programming language. So, And the syntax, as you can see, is not hard. So what the article class does is it basically specifies, it, it's basically a template of styles that you would use for short documents usually. So some other options you have that are commonly used are report, book, letter, for, for making documents that you might print, you would usually use one of these three. And it's pretty self-explanatory what you would use each of them for. Article is just for generally simpler, shorter articles. And usually if you're, for example, typesetting your homework in LaTeX, you would probably want to use article just because you don't need all the extra things that are in the report and book class. So report is for doing like a larger publication where you have uh, usually more strict guidelines for your formatting, etc. Book is for, as you would imagine, books. And letter is for snail mail letters, so if you're using that in 2020, good on you, I guess. But and of course, there's nothing stopping you from using one of the other ones for a use case they weren't necessarily designed for. It's just, well, you would usually want to use a thing that's designed for your use case. So here we have begin document and end document. So 
with these begin and end commands, these are what these define what we call an environment. Or not define, but they, they mark the beginning and end of an environment. So in this case, document is our environment. And what you put inside the document environment is your actual content. So I can type some some more stuff here. And if I compile that, you can see it shows up here, just like our hello world that we started with. Now, obviously this is very, very basic, so we probably want to do a little bit more with our documents. So one thing that's important to be aware of is the preamble, or what's called the preamble in LaTeX. So everything after your document class command and before your begin document command, so everything that you would put in here is called the preamble. Now what kind of things would you put in there? Okay, so let's look here. So this is a more um, developed but still pretty basic document. And now I haven't compiled this yet, so this is still the old output, but let's just take a look at what we have here. So first of all, here with the document class command, this whole section is added. It's almost like a second argument to a function. But what what's going on here is in the square brackets, those are what's called options. So usually those are optional arguments, and those control the... I, I guess one way to say it is the arguments inside the braces here, those are the quote-unquote main arguments, and what these do is they're modifiers to say how should the document class command work with the article class. So we've specified 12 point to be our normal font size, and we want to use letter size paper. So in other parts of the world, for example, you might want to use A4 paper, or you, and for your font size, so you can choose from 10, 11, or 12 point font as your normal size. And there are ways to get to override those restrictions and go with other ones, but that's it, it's not normal LaTeX is not really designed for that, so that's where packages come in. So, like I said, we have your preamble, everything between document class and begin document. So all of this is the preamble. So these lines that begin with the percent symbol, these are comments. So you can see there's a comment up there as well. And what we're doing here is saying use package, the input enc package, or input encoding, and we're passing the UTF-8 option to that package so that the input enc package will be loaded with the UTF-8 settings, quote unquote. So what this does is, first of all, this is a command you want in pretty much every LaTeX document nowadays. It will basically make non-ASCII characters inside your LaTeX source code not kill the compiler with errors. Now, there are, I mean, it, it sounds like from the fact that LaTeX can't handle UTF-8 by default, that it's old, it's basically outdated and 
not why are people still using it in 2020 well the truth is this is where you get into the discussion about different LaTeX engines compilers etc there's a link i put where you can learn more about that in the gitlab repo but basically lua latex or z latex i don't know if that's how you're supposed to pronounce it they are more modern engines that are designed to handle unicode input just fine with no hassles but if you're using something like uh pdf latex here you can see you can use all kinds of different commands to actually compile your document depending on what exact engine, compiler, etc. you want to use. So they all have pros and cons. PDF LaTeX is, it dates back to the 1990s, I believe, maybe even late 80s, which was basically pre standard Unicode specification. So PDF LaTeX doesn't really like non-ASCII characters on its own, but you can use the input enc package to make a lot of Unicode characters work properly. And you can also use it in a more advanced way to make more or less any Unicode character work in some fashion, but we're not going to cover that today. So the other thing we have here is the geometry package, and we've passed the option margin equal one inch to that. So what the geometry package does is it's going to, or in combination with our option here, is it's going to change our margins to one inch. So if I go and so remember, this was our plain example here, right? So these are probably huge margins for, say, if you were typesetting an assignment. So now if we, if we compile this one, these are one inch margins, which may still be large depending on what you're using it for, but you can change this. So I can change this to half an inch or two inches, or really whatever you want. Now, let's move on to the actual document section. So, this is, like I said before, where you put your actual content. And let me go back to reasonable zoom. Just do that. So here you can see exactly how the input source translates to the output. You have an empty line here that separates one paragraph from the next. You have two backslashes just like this, and that creates a line break right here. But notice this isn't indented, so that's not a new paragraph. And you can also put that at the end of a line if you want, just for formatting of your source code. And you can indent your code however you want. Please don't make it disgusting like this, but you can if you really want to. And also, white space in general, not just indentation, is ignored by LaTeX. I mean, it's not completely ignored, it's that it will look at all of this as just one space. So you can see, even though I have however many spaces here, it just looks normal in the actual document. All right, so next, let's take a look at sectioning. So 
we went over command syntax a little bit. Now, here are... How could you double space that? Okay, I will go back. All right, so double spacing as in between the lines or double spacing between as in a space between the paragraphs. Between each line. So there is a line spread command. Let me see if I can remember how to use it. Yep. So line spread command, and we can set that to anything from two. For example, for double spacing, 1.5, one is obviously the default. We can make it borderline unreadable. Okay, it won't actually let you, it won't actually let you write lines over other lines, but yeah. So just like this, line spread command lets you change the factor by which your line spacing is done. All right, now back to sectioning. Okay, so like I said before, LaTeX is focused on having a natural set of commands that you would enter to achieve the formatting of your document that you want, but not waste your time trying to make sure it's all correct. And oh, if I make this text bold, then it'll start typing more bold text at the end of it, because that's how Microsoft Word and Google Docs work. So that's where these commands come in handy. And as we'll see at the end, you can actually define your own commands. So you can make your own sections if you want, or commands for other things. But we'll get to that later. So you have part, chapter, section, subsection, sub subsection, paragraph, and subparagraph as the different levels of sectioning in a LaTeX document by default. So the, remember how I discussed before how there are other document classes like book and report, that's where you can use the chapter command, but the chapter command does not work in the article class, but do you really need it? You have so many different commands already. Do all the sectioning you can imagine. So, let's see, oops. Let's take a look at some examples. And the syntax, as I wrote at the bottom, looks very much like the document class command, the use package command. Most commands look like that just section and then you have braces inside your braces you put the title of your section all right so let me compile this document so here you've noticed i've added the lipsum package which using this lipsum command you can just create lorem ipsum dummy text which i'm just going to use to demonstrate here so the first command we showed is the part command. So part, this is a part name. Compile that, you can see it's automatically numbered. This is the title you specified. Works pretty much like you would expect. And of course, you can go in and modify this formatting, modify the number style, modify Make it one line instead of two, all of that if you want. Let's see, let's try section. Section. 
thumb section. So here, again, you can see automatic numbering. Formatting is different from the part, which is to be expected because the section falls under the part. Not, they're not at the same level. We can also do sub subsections, whatever, and keep doing subsections. And again, they will sort out their numbering by themselves. You don't have to worry about it. If you decide later on, oh, I want this paragraph here as my introduction to some section. Okay, perfect. But let's say paragraph uh, something, whatever. So if we say this paragraph here, this, the, the third lorem ipsum paragraph, that's what these arguments are, that's paragraph with the title something. So if we want, actually let me use a numbered section as an example. Okay. So let's say, let's say we want some other subsection. Okay, we want, let's say we want all of this to actually move to the very top of the document. Okay, so we can just cut, paste, Look at that. Numbering is again sorted out for you. This is this is part one. So this is or your your first section starts down here. So this is naturally section zero, counting backwards. And yeah, it just sorts out your numbering for you. You don't have to worry about it. No nonsense. I think technically you can do this in Microsoft Word, but it's a pain. Why would you want to do that when you can just do it so easily? Now the other thing is, you have all these numbers here, but maybe you are just, for example, I keep going back to this example, if you're just making, doing a homework assignment, you don't need numbered sections, you just want a nice heading format. So that's where this command here comes in handy. You can set counter. So this works for a variety of different, basically numeric variables or integer variables. So in this case, our variable in quotation marks is sec num depth or section numbering depth. We set it to negative one. So if we, Remember from the slide, the negative one is the part command, right? So right here we have nothing is numbered with negative one. If we set it to zero, then we have the part command is numbered, nothing else. So basically it goes for all of the levels up to but not including the one you specified as the sec num depth counter. That makes sense. Right. Any questions about basic sectioning? Right. Looks like we are good. Move on to font formatting. So here we have a, again, very, very plain document. There's, it looks kind of pathetic. Or we'll, we'll add a line break in there just so there's some more space to see everything. We want to transform these paragraphs into something utterly horrific by making things bold and italic and monospace, 
all that fun stuff. And normally, of course, you would not want to overuse these commands because your document will look utterly disgusting. But for today, we're just going to have a little bit of fun with this. So what, what, what formatting command do you guys want to start with here? On, someone in the chat, choose something. Bold or italic, okay. So let's say plain paragraph. So we're going to make plain bold because it's going to be very, very plain at the, after the end of this. And we're going to make paragraph italicized. Look at that. Oh, wrong thing shown. So what I did is I just put text bf command around the word plain and text it command with the word paragraph as the argument. So it still reads here we have a very plain paragraph that we are about to transform. But as you can see, plain is now in bold, paragraph is now in italis italics. Yes, nesting formatting is a thing too. So if we want plain to be in, let's say, monospace font. So remember, monospace font we get from the text tt command. So we can just do it just like this. Text tt, plain. And if you're wondering about the sort of the way I just overwrote the word with the command there and the word came back as the argument. That's a feature of Tech Studio. Really great LaTeX IDE. I strongly recommend it if you haven't already installed it. So now you can see, well, these two don't really mix, but let's try something else. Uh, Try small caps. Oh, that's not what we want. Yeah. Okay. Some commands don't really like to work together, as you can see. Now, I'm sure there are packages out there, in fact, I'm fairly confident that there are, that will give you bold and small caps together. But let's just stick with good old italics all right Let's fix this mess all right so here we have plain is italicized and then this whole thing, the italicized plane, is then put into boldface. All right, so underlining and strike through are not really supported in, or they're not part of LaTeX by default because the idea is you're doing it on a computer, so you should be using things like bold and italics instead of underlining, but you use the, oops, ulem package and do slash s out to get a strike through uh, uline, well, underline, yes. You should not overuse emphasis in actual this is a great, great paragraph now. So I chose not to include these in my slide for this reason, the fact that they're not part of LaTeX by default, but these, all of these documents here, as we're modifying them, I will be uh, pushing the 
final versions from the end of the presentation to the repository, so you can go back and look at exactly how we did these, if you would like. Now, are there any questions about formatting before we move on? Or about font styling, rather? Right, looks like we're okay. So the next thing we want is sizes. Oh, where are you getting the pop-up documentation? All right, so like I said, so I'm using Tech Studio. So if you looked at my uh, installation instructions in the readme.md, you probably saw me mention Tech Studio as a LaTeX IDE. And so this is all just built in so class article it, yeah it's basically you just it's all about the ide you get the right ide for the job and it will make your life a lot easier just like for any other programming language all right All right, is it online somewhere or in a man file or something? Ah, okay, so you can, yeah. So take a look at the uh, resources.md in the GitLab repository. I put a bunch of links there to useful documentation of various things some cheat sheets with quick reference for commands, etc. Uh, you can also go and let me open it up here. So there's a website called CTAN, the Comprehensive Tech Archive Network, and there's a little cutoff at the top, but whatever. So if I, for example, search for the ULIM package. Now, first of all, CTAN is basically the central source for anything and everything LaTeX packages, public LaTeX packages, and uh, lots of, there's various documentation on other topics as well. Sorry about that. Yep. Yeah, ctan.org, that is exactly right. So if we go to the ULEM package here, so we can see there's a readme here, which is very basic, and there's a whole PDF of, in this case, six pages of documentation of exactly how to use the package, Basic use, as you can see, you can do more than just basic underlining. Define new commands. Yeah, there's lots of things you can find on CTAN. Sometimes, sometimes the packages go a little overboard on their documentation. So in that case, that's where you might want to look at other online resources, like if you have a specific thing you're trying to do, usually if you just search it on Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever, uh, you'll often find links to, say, the uh, Tech and LaTeX Stack Exchange or the LaTeX forums or any number of other places where you might find relatively simple, straightforward documentation of exactly what you're looking for. All right.
go back to font sizes. So here we have the commands that you would want to use. So remember, we specified 12 point as our regular font size in the any offline documentation tools. Um, I'm not really sure offhand because I usually just use the online tools anyway. But if I come across something, I will put it in resources.md. So check there, I guess. So oh, actually, you're right. Text Live Tech Live does come with all the PDFs. So I don't know if there's a way you can auto launch them. I I imagine you could make your own script to do that fairly easily, or you could, depending on what IDE you're using. So especially if you're using something like VS Code that's designed for a lot of different things, I imagine you could integrate into the IDE with an extension, some way to automatically launch the documentation. So. Yeah, like I said, fortunately I don't have a great answer right now, but it's the possibility is there. And I'm sure something does exist. Just have to find it. Right, so font sizes. So these are all these all change the font sizes relative to your normal font size that you specified in your document class options. So in this case the slash normal size command that would give you the 12 point font that we specified earlier. These other commands would scale the font up or down by whatever factor. And the syntax for these is actually different from what we saw before. Remember, this is the syntax for font styles where you have, for example, text BF, and then in the braces as an argument, you specify the text you want bolded. Here, these commands work on the scope they're in. So you can use the braces to create what's called a group. So let's go back to the document. So here, let's say we want to mangle as a group. So I just put braces around there. So you can see the output has not changed at all. It looks exactly the same. But now if we put a command like say large inside here, notice this text got larger, but nothing outside of this group did. That's it's just the basic concept of scope that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with with other languages, and you just define scope by the braces in LaTeX. And of course, we can also do something like this. We can say slash huge. And now if you notice, so remember, these commands are relative to the normal font size, not relative to the, I guess, current font size. So even though all of this, that we are going to mangle this time by messing with the, uh, wait, no, that we are going to mangle this time. I lost my brace there. So even though all of that is in the group with the huge command, this subgroup here, with the to mangle text as the large command. And since this large is relative to 12 point, not relative to huge, you notice the text size of to mangle is the same as it was before when we didn't have the huge. All right, any questions about basic grouping and text sizes? As a quick aside, various symbols you might want to use, like for example, if you want the braces command 
or if you want the brace characters in your actual text, there's a few different ways to do it, but in general what you would want is something like this. So let's say here add a space. So here we can see we just escaped the brace characters using Xdoc. I knew that existed. I don't know why it slipped my mind. Perfect. So if you use the backslash, which is sort of the overarching character for everything in LaTeX, that will escape the braces and output them like this. You can also do, well, those are math mode commands, so we'll not worry about that right now. Something like the backslash. So remember, this is a line break, so that's not going to print a backslash. I'll just show you. It gives an error because there is no line there to end. Because it's You put a line break at the beginning of the line, what is that? Can't do that. So the command you want slash text backslash and you can see there we have our backslash and yeah so things like that there's some other symbols too that you have to sort of escape or use a custom command to enter but you know it's these are fairly rarely used symbols so it's not so bad how would you add a space after that text backslash? Okay, so good question. Now, so remember with our other commands here, like use package ulem, so we have our argument in the braces. Now, if you don't have it in the braces, it sort of just treats the next character as the argument. So what we can do is we can force it to not do that by putting the set of braces there. That's saying your argument for text backslash is inside these braces, in this case, nothing. And then this space is actually part of the document. It's not the, the argument, right? So there we go. There's a space. All right. And anything else? OK. Spacing. So spacing is like I showed before. We have the two backslashes for a line break. We put an empty line separating text to do a paragraph break. You do the line break and the paragraph break, it'll skip a line and then do the paragraph break as you would expect. Now, sometimes you don't want your paragraphs to be indented, so you can do, you can run this command right here. So set length, par indent, zero point. You could use some other units like zero inches too. It would do the same thing. And so now there's no more indentation there. Yeah, this syntax is a little bit funky but basically this is the first argument the slash par indent is the first argument to set length and then this is the second argument um, sometimes the syntax is not super super consistent in LaTeX because there's so many different packages but that's what documentation is for can you do inverse indent, like a works cited page? You definitely can. So if you're, use, if you're doing a works cited page, first of all, you might want to consider using BibTeX, which will just automate your bibliography, basically, and make your life easier without you having to worry about it. But um, I haven't personally done something like that yet. So I don't know offhand how you would do that. Uh, let's see. I'll try something. That length. Uh, right. 
Actually, I think you can just do negative in here. Yeah, there you go. Just like that. Yeah, there's a built-in bibliography command. You probably want to use bibtech if you're doing that, but you can use this to specify negative indentation as well. All right. Lists. So here we have another document. This time, this document looks a lot more complicated than the previous ones. We're slowly building up our examples here. So let's just compile this. So you can see, as you would expect from any competent word processor, or in this case, document preparation program, you can add bulleted lists, unordered lists, numbered lists, ordered lists, whatever you want to call them. What about for a specific paragraph? Ah, there, we'll go back to this real quick. So, I believe we do, let's just go back to that. Oops. I think this should work. Yep. Oh. Bad. Yeah, so this command will... So th this command here, because it's in the preamble, it basically applies to the whole document. But what happens is inside our document environment, we can run a lot of these commands too. So we can't use use package inside the document environment. That would make no sense. We load a package for the whole document, not a section of it. So we can run the set length part indent command here. So that sets it to half an inch of indent. And then here we can reset it back to zero. So you can see the first paragraph has half inch indent. The other two do not. All right, back to lists. So here we have, I've loaded a new package here. We're gonna get back to that later. First, let's go over bulleted lists. Now, yes, so here is our normal paragraph and I've set the paragraph indent to zero just so it's a little clearer where all the margins are. So just like we have the document environment, we have the itemize environment. You would use this for your bulleted unordered lists. So you just use the slash item command, then enter your first list item, another slash item command, your second list item. Like I said, the LaTeX really doesn't care about the white space, so you don't have to separate them out on lines if you don't want to. You can also nest the itemized environment inside itself, which is how you get second level, third level list items, etc. Yeah, very simple. Now the other thing here is if we add the optional option of no item sep, it's just going to not add spacing between the bolt the list items. If that's what you want. All right, so now ordered lists. So without loading this package here, we can still do most of this. But what the enum item package with the short labels option allows us to do is down here. So you can see here, the first three items here, they're just normal one, two, three, right? No options, is just, it's just the defaults. But here we specified the option of the Roman numeral four with uh, parentheses or IV parentheses. 
and that tells this specific item, not any of the other ones, to use this as the label. We can specify anything else we want here. If we want to put misspelling of four, we could use that. And we can make it small caps too, whatever you want. But also we can do this here. We pass an option to the enumerate environment itself, just like this, right on your begin command. Then, assuming this is one of the sort of normal um, numbering schemes that you might use, it will automatically recognize it and number your items that way. So you notice right here, these are numbered with Roman numeral, lowercase Roman numerals, but there's no argument here. It's not like we're manually specifying that. Now, if we put something weird here, like for example, if we put two, uh, what did I do here? Oh, whoops. So, if you put something weird, it's it doesn't know how to turn that into numbering, right? It, it this this is not a normal numbering scheme, so it won't automatically recognize that and number your items. It's just going to label them all the same way, at which point you might as well be using an unordered list. But yeah, if we put something that it recognizes, so for example, one in parentheses is a fairly normal numbering scheme, then it will automatically number your items that way. And of course, the... Uh, uh, the custom label right here, right? This is also helpful if, for example, if you're, you have, say, an assignment where you're not just going in numerical order, you're jumping around with your numbering, then you could do this and not have to worry about skipping numbers, I guess. All right, any questions about lists. All right. F next. F. Right, here's where we start to get into the real Here's we here's where we get to the point where Microsoft Word, Google Docs, you name it, just cannot hold a candle to LaTeX, no matter how hard they try. It's it's to the point where Microsoft Word will now accept LaTeX notation for in for equations and turn it into its own Microsoft Word crap equations. So there's two main types of equation rendering, math mode rendering in LaTeX. You have inline math and display math. So inline math, you have the, yes, this is the owl beamer theme. You can look that up on CTAN if you want. The, if you use backslash, parentheses to open it and backslash closing parentheses to close it that everything inside it will be first of all in math mode so it will render like math and it's going to be I guess short and small so that it fits within a line of text you use brackets instead of parentheses that's for display math so for display math, typically you would have it on its own line, full size, between two paragraphs of text. So there, it is actually possible to put 
So, for example, just like you would have numbered figures, numbered tables, you can number your equations by using the equation environment. So it's fundamentally the exact same thing as using the bracket notation from the previous slide. It just adds the number to the side. Of course, that will increment automatically. And now, sometimes you might also want your full display, display style math, but in line in your text. So in that case, you still do your normal parentheses, but you use the display style command and that works similarly to the font sizing command like large huge whatever where it will apply to the group the the whole equation in this case so you can see unlike on the previous slide where we had our inline integral it was short small integral now we still have an inline integral but it's larger full size and you might also notice, uh, switch to the document here. All right, so we'll go through this notation shortly, but you might notice sometimes notation like this, especially if you're looking at questions and answers by other people. So, Uh, so what I showed you is with the backslash and the parentheses, what you might see online or in other places is the single dollar sign. So in theory, they do the same thing, but behind the scenes, this is a tech thing that is more likely to cause problems. So you, when you're using LaTeX, which if you don't know the difference between LaTeX and Tech, just you're using LaTeX. Just use this one. Don't use the dollar sign notation. And similarly, if you do double dollar sign, that is the same thing as the display environment, but. Again, this is the notation you would want to use because it just causes less problems. You're, you're not likely to run into problems if you use this, but you just shouldn't. It's just one of those things. So anyway. So here, start off at the top. So for this one, so I don't know how many of you have looked at the resources I posted, but one of them was LaTeX Math for Undergrads Cheat Sheet. That, especially when you're getting started typesetting math in LaTeX, that is going to be your best friend. It has basically everything I have in this document and more reference of commands to insert Greek letters, various symbols, whatever. It's all in a single two-page document, very nicely written, very nicely formatted. So you should take a look at that. But start here with the use package. So we want AMS Math, or American Ma uh, Mathematical Society Math. That's sort of their main package, which adds a lot of math features to LaTeX. And now, to be clear, you don't need any of these packages to do basic math mode typesetting. But these add a whole bunch of features like symbols and operators that you probably want to have, so you might as well just add the package. So here, let's start off with doing basic exponents and subscripts, or superscripts and subscripts. You use your caret key, that's shift six. You're on an a US keyboard at least. And so that it's very simple. You would write this is exactly how you would write x to the power of 2 in plain text, right? It's the same notation in here. Now, if you want to do x to the power of 20, notice that doesn't work. 
just like that. That's where the grouping comes in handy again. So here we have x to the power of 10, but 10 is inside the braces, so it's a group. That whole group is the exponent. And then here we can, of course, just do 3x to the, again, we have a group, y plus 2. So honestly, most of the syntax you would use for your basic math typesetting is very natural if you are even remotely used to typing out your math in plain text. So here you have underscores to get subscripts. So it works exactly the same as the caret, it's just a subscript instead of a superscript. And again, same thing with the grouping. Now, fractions. So, I should have actually included a display style for this one, but that's okay, we'll get to that later. So, it's just the frac command, you have two arguments. First argument is your numerator, second argument is your denominator. Because these are already braces, they're already groups, so you can put multiple characters inside them without adding a second layer of grouping. 3x plus 3, whatever. But that's not going to change anything, just like it did earlier. Uh, radicals. SQRT command. Very straightforward. You want an nth root, you just you add the optional parameter here with the brackets, and you can say, I mean, I want the 50th root of 5, or the nth root of 5, or the x plus 3 root of 5, whatever you want. So those are all very straightforward. Now, this is the part where you're probably not used to it if you just by doing plain text uh, math. So where we have large operators, right? So integral. So here, the command we want is int, right? So it uses the same superscript, subscript notation, just like our exponents and subscripts from before. So underscore zero, caret two, that means integrate from 0 to 2. And that's all of this. This is just the symbol here. Remember, it's not, LaTeX is not a computerized algebra system or anything like that. It's just for typesetting. So it's going to take what you type and turn it into the output. So you have x squared dx. It's very simple. Now, have this thing in here. This is called a thin space. So basically in math mode, actually I forgot to cover this before. I'm gonna go back real quick. So you can do commands like slash b space uh, one inches, right? That adds a one inch space that adds a one inch space right in here, vertical space to be clear. Now we can also do things like uh, right here, slash horizontal space. And let's say we want that to be one centimeter, whatever. You can do that. Now, a lot of times, what you might want to do for vertical spacing is use the em unit. So if I do 5em, if you're familiar with CSS and web development, you probably already know what this is. But basically, this means five times the line height, or five lines of spacing in here. So, yes. And you can also, with these line breaks, you can add space just by putting an optional parameter in the brackets of, say, I don't know, five centimeters. And if you get rid of that, it's just going to be your standard line break. 
So now back to the math. So the backslash comma is a thin space. Now there's also a medium space with a colon, a thick space or a wide space. I don't remember which one it's called exactly, but so these are just quick commands you can use to insert spacing in your math type setting. And of course, if you're once you play with it and decide exactly how you want your integrals to look. So for example, there's a command called mathrm which basically makes what's inside it display as normal Roman text. So you can see now the D looks like a normal D as if it would be in text mode, not math mode. But the X is still normal variable. So, and again, that command, along with several others that you'll find useful, they're in that cheat sheet. So, yes, we can, yeah, spacing. And yeah, once you, as I was saying, once you figure out the formatting that you like for something like an integral, you might want to just make a custom command to where you just put in your uh, minimum, maximum, or your lower limit, upper limit, what am I saying? Your bounds of integration, your expression that you're integrating, and the variable you're integrating with respect to, and then have LaTeX take care of turning all of that into a nicely formatted integral exactly how you like it every time without fussing with spaces. But we'll get to custom commands at the end. And then, so other operators, for example, like sum, that's the sum, that's a summation. It works the same way where your subscript effectively is your n equals 2 there. So remember, we have to group it because this is three characters, not just one. And then caret to 5, so n equals 2 to 5, 3 to the n, summation. And yeah, so you can also see here, this is the difference between display, or sorry, inline math and display math as far as how they look. The display math, if I try to type something on either side, it's not going to let, it by default puts the display math on its own line. So that's where, again, if you really want your display math in line, you would use the display style command, just like that. Now, grouping. So we already talked about grouping as far as tokens in LaTeX where you use the braces. But when you're doing math, you obviously you might want to group things with parentheses and brackets and braces for the sake of your equations, and you want those to actually show up in the output. So that's where you have the left parentheses, right parentheses. You can also do left bracket and right parentheses if you want that for whatever reason. So the idea is left matches with a right. When you have your left matching with the right, the operator will automatically size to whatever's inside it. So in this case, it's just x plus 3. It's just normal line height. So the size is the normal height. But for the second set here, uh, to make these the same. So you can see this is a fraction, this is an integral, so both of these are taller. So your operators, your bracket and your parentheses here, they resize to match the contents of the group. 
and things like exponents or subscripts that you put on the outside, they will also be placed accordingly. Now, sometimes you will want the same effect of a group where you have your operator here matching the size of the contents of the group, but you don't necessarily want the uh, symbol on both sides. In that case, you can just use a period just like this, slash left period, that will basically create a invisible phantom left grouping symbol which will match with this right vertical bar so that they will conform to the height of the dy dx here. And again, the subscript there will be placed accordingly. Now if you're lazy, like pretty much everyone, let's be honest, and you don't put your lefts and your rights, and you just put the symbols, this is what you get. So sometimes you can get away with it, but if you're, if the things you're grouping are not the normal single line height, it's going to look terrible. So there are places where you can be lazy, and you know you will be lazy, because that's, we're all humans. I'm lazy too. And th there are places where you can't get away with it. You have to have the full notation of having the left and the right symbols. Right, this, this looks terrible. This part looks okay. Looks the same as the other one. These two look normal. These two terms do not look normal. Yeah. All right, matrices. So the notation for these is a little more complicated because you have a lot of data to put into a small space. So we begin a matrix environment. So there's various sort of versions of the matrix environment. There's, we, we have just matrix, which has no uh, parentheses, brackets, anything like that, separating it. We have B matrix, which adds brackets. B matrix, which puts vertical bars. Uh, is it VV? No. Okay. Well, I clearly don't remember which one that is, but... So this is where there's another document I put in the resources.md. It goes over all of these things, matrices, multi-line equations, and helpful examples, shows you all the input commands and how they look in the output. But yes, so you have your B matrix environment or whatever other matrix environment, and then inside it, start in the top left. So we have two X, then we use an ampersand, so that's what in LaTeX is called an alignment operator. So, like, for example, if I... Uh, not what I wanted. I add an extra one here. Okay. It's being smarter than I wanted it to be. Whatever. So... Yeah. 2x, your alignment operator and then 3y, so that is what splits the 2x and the 3y across the row, separates the column. And we do our line break, our usual line break uh, um, symbol there. And then that takes us to the next row, where we do the same syntax, 4x and 5y. There's also the aligned environment, so that's also shown in the document I mentioned earlier. I guess this one's a web page. Yeah, so the using this as an alignment operator is not unique to the matrix environments. It, it's used here, used in cases, align. It's even used for the tabular environment that we're going to talk about a little bit later, but yeah, so get used to this sort of notation here with the 
uh, line breaks and ampersands. And yeah, again, so like I said with the commands to insert symbols, so NEQ is the not equal symbol there. And it all makes sense as you start using the symbols, you'll very quickly memorize all the commands because the commands are very intuitive. But until that point, cheat sheet is your friend. And also detexify. Because de what detexify or detexify, I don't even know how you should pronounce that. What it will let you do is if you you can draw a symbol and it will basically tell you what the command is to get that symbol. It's pretty neat, very useful. So yeah. So like you can see, they can have any number of rows, any number of columns. You don't need the grouping because that's sort of done by default by the ampersands here. It knows everything between the ampersands is one cell. Not hard when you get used to it. Now, next thing here. So you might use this if you're writing a system of equations or if you're doing something like this where you have different uh, conditions and you have a piecewise function. So you can see f of x equals, so that's normal. Then we have the cases environment, b in cases, n cases. First line, we have x squared plus 12x in the same syntax we have from before. And then we put a comma at the end of it, just because the uh, same ampersand alignment operator. Uh, the text command here, so this is a command that only works in math mode, but what it will do is it will let you insert normal text inside of a math equation, right? So this if is just normal text. Now, like I showed before with the DX, with the math RM, they're not quite the same. The text will literally just use the normal text formatting. Math RM just makes it upright and not italicized. There's, yeah, there's a little bit of nuance to it, and you can look it up if you're interested, but the general idea is what I just said. And then again, everything outside of the text command is just normal math again. Yeah, if square root x again on the next line with the same line break character, same alignment tab, same thing. It's another case where if you're writing piecewise equations frequently, you might want to make a custom command to get the spacing and the punctuation every exactly how you would like. I know a lot of people, they just, they don't put that part. So you can put it, you can customize it however you want and make a custom command to do it exactly the way you want. And finally we have, um, so like, like I mentioned before, with the braces, you can't just put the, the braces mean everything to LaTeX, basically. So you have to escape them with backslashes for them to actually show up in your output. It's exactly what's happening here. So it's left slash brace, not just left and then a brace. We have one, comma, and again a thin space, two, times two, etc. The main thing here is you have the various, you have L dots, C dots, or low dots and centered dots. There's several others, like you can do diagonal dots, dots that are displayed on the top. Anyway, again, look at the cheat sheet. Because we could probably spend the whole two hours on typesetting math if we wanted to. So any questions about math?
All right. Looks like there are none. So, oh, late for that slide. So let's move on to putting text inside our documents as in embedding it, not text as in a paragraph. So what's happening here is we have the verbatim environment. So this is again built into LaTeX. There's also a package you can do which will add a better verbatim environment. I think I think the package is better VRB. And that gives you some extra options where if you want your your source code here to look nice is so the verbatim environment basically what it says is it tells LaTeX everything inside here don't process it that means if you have indentation the indentation is going to show up in your final output right so if you don't want the indentation to show up there, then you need everything aligned all the way to the left. So what this will do is it just takes everything inside here, no processing. So you notice we have we have braces here, but LaTeX is not complaining about it. It's not trying to do anything fancy with it. And this is all just printed out in the monospace font right into your document. But, you know, if you're putting code in your document, you probably want it to be nice and colorful, right? So that's where there are a few different packages you can use. But we're going to focus on the minted package because that's generally the easiest one to use for beginners or to get started with. Now the upside and downside to Minted is that it uses pigments. And pigments is uh, a Python module if you are not familiar that it's basically a library for syntax highlighting and it supports I think 300 or so languages, something like that. But because the minted package uses Python and pigments, it has to be able to actually talk to Python. So you can't have your sandboxed, locked down LaTeX com compilation environment where a package can just run random commands on your shell, right? On your system. So that's where you have to use the shell escape argument. So you can see, if I load up my text studio configuration here, remember my default compiler set to PDF LaTeX, right? So my PDF LaTeX command, I added in the shell escape parameter or argument here. And that basically just tells PDF LaTeX and LaTeX that something in here package has permission to actually just run commands on my system. So, of course, there's a reason that's not default. If don't download a random document from the internet and compile it with shell escape because it really can just run random commands on your system, which is not a good time. So yeah, if you, if you must compile untrusted documents that use Minted, I would recommend using Overleaf, because they have Minted support with pigments, everything they need all taken care of, and you don't have to run possibly sketchy code on your own personal system. But anyway, so the way this works is the minted environment. You can see it looks very similar to the verbatim environment where 
indentation matters. And then you specify an argument, which is what language we're typesetting. So in this case, this is Rust code from our very own Ryan Slauson. And it's syntax highlighted exactly how pigments would syntax highlight Rust code. So if you were using any other software that uses pigments as the back end, it would come out the same. And also, if you know how to customize pigments syntax highlighting, you can customize that and that will change the minted output. This is literally just straight out of pigments, however it's configured on your system. So the nice thing about this, this is similar to one of the things you can do with the uh, better verbatim environment that I briefly mentioned earlier, is, let's see, no, actually, no, this is not where you want it. So up here, there's a set minted command. So this is... This specifies the defaults for the whole document. Now you can, you can, if I move over here, that was cut off before, the line numbers argument tells Minted to display the line numbers. If I get rid of that, well, there's no more line numbers as you can see. There's also something you can do where, okay, first of all, to show you, let's say I want my source code to look like this for the indentation to be consistent with the rest of it, with all my paragraphs, right? That adds this ridiculous space, just like the verbatim environment. But you can use the auto gobble parameter up there, and now if we look at it, so it just goes and looks at all of the leading white space that sees. Oh, you have eight spaces of leading white space on every single line, or sorry, at least eight spaces. Then it will go and take those eight spaces, chop them off, and set this as the left margin. That makes sense. With the better verbatim environment, you can specify exactly how many uh, characters to gobble off of the beginning of your lines, but yeah, that's pretty simple. You can look that up pretty easily, so I'm not going to spend much time on that here since we're getting close to the end. All right. Now, the next thing we want to go over is figures and tables graphics, images, things like that. How do we put those inside the document? So, remember one of the... Uh, one of the things we mentioned at the beginning as a beautiful feature of LaTeX is that it will sort out a lot of the tedious garbage formatting nonsense for you. You don't have to worry about it which small documents it might not seem to make much of a difference, but if you're writing a large document like a book, it definitely makes a difference. So the figure and table environments, those are what are called floats. And basically what that means is LaTeX will intelligently place them in your document wherever they make sense. And you can tell LaTeX about what placements are acceptable by using one or more of these specifiers. You can, you can technically use all of them if you really want, but there's a built-in order of priority. So LaTeX will just match the first one in that built-in list. You can look that up online if you care, but. So if we use lowercase h, that means you're telling LaTeX, place it here, approximately, more or less here, as long as that 
is actually going to look nice and not be horrible. Now if you put an exclamation mark with that, so H exclamation mark, that will tell LaTeX, forget about is this a nice placement, I just, I really want it here, can you please just put it here? But even then, it's not always going to be put exactly there, because it's not meant to do that. But if you load the float package, and you use a capital H, you're telling LaTeX, no, 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 don't intelligently place this. I want it here. It goes here, exactly here, not put it anywhere else. So again, that's relevant for smaller documents, probably not super relevant for larger publications. And you can also do TBNP, which will try to place your float at the top of a page, bottom of a page, or on a dedicated page where there's no paragraphs, it's only floats. So, and for those who have been paying attention to the slides, at the bottom I've had links on a lot of these slides to where you can read more about what is in the slide. So, So let's go into our document here. So here, let, let's start by looking at the source code here. So inside our document, so okay, first of all, use package float. I don't have it uh, loaded. Don't, I mean, it's pretty obvious what place it here means, so we won't worry about that, but the command is right here. If you're curious and looking at the file head, uh, after the fact, we're going to talk about the graphic X package shortly, but for now, let's just look at float placement. So we started with here in the code is where figure, we'll talk about this shortly, is defined. That's figure one to be clear. Now, where is figure one actually? That's not figure one. It's not figure one. That's not figure one. Figure one is all the way over here. Page two. It's not even on page one. And yet, the first thing in the source code was our figure one. So why is that? So we have our begin figure, our figure environment, and we chose placement P, or on a dedicated page for floats. So that's why you don't see figure one here. It's on a separate page where there's no other, no paragraphs. Now the centering command, this works just like your font size commands inside a group that just makes that group centered horizontally to be clear. So let's take a look at our figure. So the include graphics command, that's what comes from the graphic X package. There's an older package named graphics, spelled like the actual word, but graphic X is a derivative of that with more features that should use that and not graphics with an S. So what we have is our graph.png, that's this image file here, and that's in the same directory as the text, as our uh, source code document here. So we can also do things like dot dot slash if it's in the directory above, or in a subdirectory slash. So if you want, for example, an image directory, you could do something like that. But in this case, we just have it in the same directory. So it's just the name of the file. And now here, as our options, we specified the height to be 2.5 inches. And it will keep the aspect ratio by default, right? So this is 2.5 inches tall and however wide it is to fit in that height. You can also specify something like width equals 2.5 inches, but 
doesn't keep the aspect ratio anymore, it just uses exactly these. We want it to keep the aspect ratio but fit inside this bounding box, then we uh, just, uh, no, what is it? There it is. Keep aspect ratio parameters. Now, the width is no more than 2.5 inches, the height is no more than 2.5 inches. Now we have another command here, caption. Clearly an accurate graph float. So that is this. This is the name of your figure. Very self-explanatory, that's the captions. Yep. So, and we also have this label command. Now this is completely invisible on the actual output. So this is where that fig graph that corresponds with this comes from. So the label just, it basically puts a tag on this figure. And this tag can be whatever you want. Set it to like, I don't know, random text if you want it to be. And then it will still be the same, figure one. This the ref command, it just returns the number, the, the figure number that's assigned to the figure with this label. So a notation I like to use as start off the figures with fig and the tables with tab, but we will get to that in a moment. So yes, that's that. And then here we have the tabular environment, this is not a float, right? This is tabular, this is not table. Table is basically the same thing as a figure, right? Except it is labeled as table whatever number, and the caption goes on the top instead of the bottom. But otherwise they're basically the same thing, they're just floats. So if you want to insert an actual table, that's where you want the tabular environment. Table is just float. Just saying this object, whatever it is, maybe it's an image of a spreadsheet, label it as a table, treat it like a table, treat it like a, a figure, basically. But tabular is actually where you make rows and columns inside your spreadsheet, or inside your LaTeX file, sorry. So the way this works is we have our first argument here that specifies our columns, right? So vertical bar, CL vertical bar. So each of these, the each column can be CL or R, representing center aligned, left aligned, or right aligned. And so in this case we have two columns, specifier and result. Specifier column we want center aligned, result column we want left aligned. That's where CL comes from. And then we have the vertical bar on the left and on the right, none in the middle. We can add one in the middle just like that if we want. And then for our rows, so first of all we have H line which puts a horizontal line right there. So if I comment that out, you'll see it goes away. And then our header row, specifier, and result. You can of course run your text formatting commands if you want. H line again, and then we have our monospace font for all of these specifiers here. Don't forget our alignment operator, the same thing that we saw before. And again, our second column. And line break operator is what separates rows of the table. So very straightforward there. It might feel a little weird in the first place, but you'll get used to it soon enough. And it's not really that confusing once you figure it out. 
So now, here in the code is where table 1 is defined, right? Begin table, and table, this is clearly our table 1. It's not here. Why is that? So we specified multiple specifiers, well, multiple placement parameters here. Is there a V-line command for vertical lines? So for vertical lines, remember you want these, you put these in your column specifier, right? So like right at the top, C, vertical line, L, vertical line. So if I just leave it as CL, there's no vertical lines. If I, I can put a vertical line, or a pipe character, that is, in between C and the L, and put it on the left and right of the table. I can remove it from the middle. That's how you do your vertical lines. Okay, so there is a way to do vertical lines for only part of the table, but it's kind of a pain, not very nice. So you can you can look it up. It's 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 one of those things where yeah, not LaTeX is basically designed to make nice documents following standard formats. It's not really designed to be the utmost in configurability or easy configurability. So you can customize everything if you want to, but some things are just not really ideal to do in LaTeX. There, without a doubt, there are advantages of your Microsoft Word, Google Docs, because you can easily add and remove every single segment of border and do more funky things. So yeah, if you want to do your partial vertical lines, you can look that up. But there's also, I don't know if this is necessarily what you're looking for. Oops. There's a multi-column command. So if I do two, they center, Say hello. Uh, line break. So you can see this one. This is kind of getting toward your partial vertical lines, right? So if I add the vertical lines here, then it will look like it actually fits in the table. But the multi-column command, what it does is it it says basically. This cell spans two columns. In this, the first argument is the number of columns it spans, so in this case, two. Then the second one is the column specifier, just like the one we had above. So we could also just make two new columns here. Let's say we just change the alignment, so we could do H and approximately here. Oh. Okay. That's not correct. I don't know why I'm saying that. This is for making one cell. Yeah. Take a look at the link uh, Devin Zanakdi posted. You want more on this. Because again, everything in this presentation is just the basics. You can spend a lot more time going down the rabbit hole very easily if you are determined enough. Yeah, so this table, just like the figure, is a float. So we specified BT as the placement uh, parameters. So that means bottom of the page or top of the page. So in this case, it shows top, because I guess top is higher priority internally than bottom. That's why, even though this is defined pretty much at the end of the document, it shows up at the top of the page. Again, this is our tabular. This is our actual table inside the table and the, the float environment. And yeah, this is the same syntax as we just went over. Label works the exact same way. 
And then finally, we just have our include graphics command that's not inside a float that just is displayed just like any other paragraph content would be. All right, any questions on that? Yeah, Overleaf documentation is very good for uh, giving you the information you need very in, I guess, the basic information you need very quickly. Uh, wrap text around image. Um, so this is... This is one of the wrapping text around images is another one of those things where LaTeX wasn't really designed with that in mind. It's designed for very uh, sort of nice formatting of you're not really concerned about using up more space. So your figures go separately. They break up the paragraphs and all that. So there's a few different ways you could go about wrapping text around an image, but I recommend you just look those up online because we're also running out of time. Right. If something doesn't look right or the PDF won't compile, what do you usually do to troubleshoot? All right, so that is a good question. So one thing is if something doesn't look right in the PDF, so a lot of IDEs, I know Tech Studio supports it, and VS the VS Code extension supports it. I haven't tried the uh, IntelliJ one, so I don't know about that. But there's something called SyncTech, or SyncTex if you prefer, where basically you can, in the PDF, you can... Usually it's control click and it will take you exactly to the source code corresponding to the output you clicked on, as you can see right now. And in Tech Studio, I can also right click and hit go to source. So that can point you toward what part of your document is likely responsible for the issue. But the other thing is you just you want to compile your document frequently after making small changes, similar to testing your code. You don't want to make a whole bunch of changes and then test it only after you implement all those changes. You want to do periodic testing as you're implementing it so that you can have a much better idea of what you changed that could be causing something to not look right. So it's... Yeah, I, it's, it's kind of, it's hard to answer that question, really. It's, it's sort of, of course, part of it, just like any other programming language, it's, it just comes down to experience. Once you have experience working in LaTeX, you'll generally have a feel for some of the things that can go wrong and what might have caused them to go wrong, how do you fix them, etc. All right, and of course, the other thing is search your issues on the internet because most likely someone else has encountered them at some point. All right, so the final thing we're going to talk about is custom commands. So this is sort of, this is the point where you're once once you are really comfortable working with LaTeX and you start making custom commands and everything, you you that's basically peak LaTeX. Well, I say basically because you can go and do things like making your own packages or making your own document classes, but peak LaTeX user, let's say. So let's just compile this code here. 
I'm going to go back and look at the, the definitions here, but basically, so it's a very simple document again, just input ink and geometry packages, and we've just gotten rid of our paragraph indentation. Now if you look in the document here, join the flash lug, but it shows up as Arizona State University Linux Users Group. Now, now we can look at the actual syntax for defining that. Very simple. A new command is a command in and of itself. First argument is the command you want to create, the name of the new command. Second argument is what happens when you run that command. So, it's very simple. When you call slash lug, it just puts this in place. Effectively, same as that. Right? But this, I mean, sometimes you might have a use for a command like this, which is literally just a shorthand for some long string of text that you would you might want to repeat. But other times you want your command to actually maybe have some logic or take an argument and do something with it. So this is a command I use very frequently for scientific notation. So I kept the name of the command very short. It's just one character slash e. And now here in the brackets it says one. That means it takes one argument. And then here in the second set of braces, that's the the output, same that works the same as it did before, but this one argument we passed in, it turns into this um, pound one uh, variable effectively. And so you can use that just like if you had typed in something manually. So if you can see here, so first of all, quick aside, the ensure math command just means it, it just makes sure that we are running this command in math mode. It's not going, it's going, if you're running it in text mode, it's just going to treat it like math mode anyway. So we have 2.97 times 10 to the two members of our mailing list, right? So in the source code, it just says slash E2. So if we convert that, so here. I'll just duplicate that line, right? And remember, this is our command definition. So when we put our argument here of two, that goes into that number one uh, variable effectively, and it produces it. And that's exactly what it does. Very simple. Of course, you can do more complicated commands, like uh, you can take more than one argument. Let's say uh, my custom integrals. I don't know. New command uh, my int. And we want it to take four arguments. So first argument will be our bottom limit. Second argument is our top limit of integration. Oops. Third argument is our expression. Fourth argument is our variable. I can't type today. We want to integrate with respect to, let's just say. So we want, we would want ensure math again, just so we don't have any errors with it potentially being run in text mode. And now we remember our integral notation, int, and then just like that. So our bottom limit of integration will be our first argument. Oops. Top limit of integration will be our second argument. And then we will have our expression. 
And then let's say we wanted to do that thin space and then the math rmd and then our variable of integration. Now, like I said before about the dollar signs, you may have noticed Tech Studio automatically inserted those. I don't want those, they're not needed because we're an enter math, but anyway. So, first of all, we compiled it. It compiled just fine, but we haven't actually tried out this command in use. Let's see if we can get it to work. Let's try Let's try let's let's make this manually first of all to see if into what we want. Let's say I don't know, ten X to two Y whoops two Y thirty X to the Let's put a fraction. Why not? One half power T Z. We're, we're being great mathematicians here. So now we can just do my int. Notice Tech Studio, or probably any worthwhile IDE for LaTeX, automatically recognize all your input arguments there. So, first one, we want 10x to y. 30x to the fraction 1, oops, half. And finally, with respect to z, and exactly like that, it even takes up a space in your source code. If you're going to write a lot of integrals, you might want to do something like this, but yeah. There's also more advanced ways you c where you can have optional arguments for your uh, commands, and the way you work with those is a little funky, and we're already over time, so I'm not going to say much more about that. You can look it up yourself if you are interested, of course. But, yeah, I think we will call that pretty much there. <laughs> Part two. Uh, maybe sometime. So, anyone have any questions on anything we talked about today, or even maybe something we didn't talk about today? Right. As I'm waiting for the stream delay and chat to catch up a little bit, I'm going to quickly commit and push all of this stuff. All right. Did I make that presentation in LaTeX? Yes, indeed I did. If you want, uh, the source code for my slides is actually on the repo as well. But here you can have a quick look if you want. So yeah, this is where we're using the Beamer document class, which is for making slides and presentations, not print documents. Yeah. Looks like I'll have to do another Beamer presentation. <laughs> well... All right, I will... Stick around for a little while longer, keep the stream going, and if there are no more questions, then I guess this will be the end of it.